Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Geo and Joey show. This is an adventure we're going to have today, but obviously it's a serious topic. I'll tell you what it is here in a bit. But Joey, how are you doing? Better than I deserve. Amen, brother. What we're going to talk about is what we call the state of the dead. And it revolves around the fact what happens when you die. And why is that important, Joey? I think it's important because a false view on this can lead to some mistaken conclusions and some deception. And so I think it's really important that we go back to the Bible and what the Bible teaches so that we are prepared to withstand those deceptions. Because as we mentioned in our previous episode, there is this lie, the lie that is found in Romans chapter 125 and 2 Thessalonians 2.11, and that takes us back to Isaiah 28.15, mentions that they made a covenant with death, and that if you read the rest of 28.15 and 16 and 17, it's a prophecy of Jesus, and he's going to annul that covenant with death. Because that takes us back to the first lie found in Genesis, which Satan said, you will not die. So the question to the audience and the question each of us has to answer is, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe God or are you going to believe the enemy? And that's important for our life. So before we continue, I want to pick up on a verse found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Joey, can you read it to us? And yeah. we're going to expound on it because it's key to understanding what happens at death. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. What we see there is the blueprint for the basis of human anthropology, which is a fancy way of saying human nature, the study of human beings. So what is a human being? Well, a human being is, wait, what did God do? He knelt down in the dust and he breathed into it and it became a living being. What do we have? We have dust, matter, which becomes the body. And then what he breathes into it, that is a soul, that life. And so for a human being, you have the soul and the body and they're inextricably linked. And that is important because the opposite happens at death. What happens at death? Ecclesiastes 12, 7 tells us, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Now, this is important because a lot of people think that this spirit returning to God is a conscious being, and it's not. One of the illustrations I like to use, it's a lamp. As long as the lamp is plugged to the electricity, it has this function. It can light up. But you unplug it, and that lamp is useless. And it's the same way. The electricity goes back to the generator, but the lamp is useless. And it's the same way. The spirit that goes back to God, and I like how in a previous conversation you had mentioned, what is that spirit? What's the analogy you like to use about God's memory and stuff like that? The way I heard it described at one time was that so like when we die, we don't know anything. The dead, they don't worry. They don't have fears, their loves, their hopes, their dreams. Those things are gone as far as their conscious experience is concerned. And when you think of all the dead that have died in Christ for all the years of human civilization, all their families dead, their friends dead. And so in an earthly sense, it's almost like, where are they? They don't exist. But there's the good news. The spirit's up in God. The memory of those people they're still in the mind of God. In other words, he is still able, the God who created them is able to recreate them and bring all their hopes and dreams and aspirations back. So in other words, that's the good news is that when we die, when we die in Christ, the memory of us is still with God. In other words, he's going to bring us back. And you know what's interesting about that is that when you get this topic wrong, it begins to knock down other aspects of the Bible. What is the importance of the resurrection if when you die, you go straight to heaven? Couldn't God give you a new body up in heaven? But no one will deny that there is a resurrection of the righteous and of the wicked. And we can expound on that on another <laughs> episode. But the resurrection, why? The resurrection is important because that's when he glorifies us. You mentioned in a previous episode 
that who alone has immortality? Only God has immortality. And we receive that later on when he comes back and resurrects us from the dead. But listen to what James says of what happens when you die, or is speaking about the state of the dead. In James 2.26, he says, the body without the spirit is dead. Now, it's silly to say the body without the spirit is dead, but dead means you're alive in heaven, or it means you're burning in hell forever and ever. No, the Bible says what it means, and it means what it says. The body without the spirit is dead. And Job 27.3 says, the spirit of God is in my nostrils. In other words, it's when the breath of life combines with that body that we actually have a living soul. And that's important because the question I get often, and you probably heard, well, can a soul die? I don't see it so much as the soul dying Mm -hmm. as the person died. In other words, your soul is part of who you are. So in other words, the spirit goes back to God. So the memory is there. But when the body dies, the soul dies. Because the soul and the body are used interchangeably, the soul and living being. You are a living soul. And the reason I use the word soul, it's because the Bible uses it. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And what else do we know from the New Testament? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So in other words, the soul that sinneth shall die, but all of us. In other words, And what did God say to Adam and Eve in the garden? In the day that you eat of it, I'm telling you, you will surely die. And what happened? Adam and Eve, they grew old and they died. They weren't made to die. And so that's the same thing for all of us. If we've sinned and you have, and I have, (laughs) have, we're going to die. But we have the hope of the resurrection. Amen. Verses like Job 4.17 allude to us that man is mortal. And only God has immortality. And you can cross-reference. So to the audience, I say, look, cross-reference these two verses, Job 4.17 and 1 Timothy 6.15 and 16, which says that only God has immortality. So the Bible doesn't contradict itself, but the devil does try to contradict God because he told Adam and Eve that you will not die. So who are you going to believe? That man is mortal and he dies, or that man is immortal and he never dies, whether he goes straight to heaven or to hell. Or you're going to believe 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16 that says only God has immortality. That's why this verse is so crucial. And how do we see it played out in society today? I think we see it in multiple things. When you think of a lot of the popular entertainment, there is lots of references to the occult. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big part of this. In other words, because if you have a mistaken belief on what happens when we die and where the soul is, that can lead to a lot of interesting ideas of talking to your dead loved ones or whatever. Another thing where sometimes people don't always see this as applying, but the transgender issue that we talk about, what is the central proposition of the transgender issue, right? It's Ultimately, that a person's body can be inextricably linked from the idea of their soul. Right? So in other words, you can be a man biologically, physically. The matter of your being can be a man, and yet you can have a feminine soul or a female soul. And we talk about it in like scientific, science kind of the science language. Yeah. But really what they're talking about is this spiritual heresy. In other words, that the soul and the body are not linked, but they are linked, right? So they're like, I could believe that I'm a woman, but my body says otherwise, and my body and my soul are inextricably linked. And unfortunately, this dualism, which is what it is, came from Greek philosophy, and it snuck into the church, and it's been pushed by Christianity, but falsely, because we are a living being. The question then comes, what happens? We just learned from Ecclesiastes 18.20 that the soul that sins will die, that every person is a sinner, and so all of us, the wages of sin is death, we die. But 
this notion of whether you die, you go straight to heaven or straight to hell is also refuted from Scripture. In John 5, 28 and 29, it says, All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. If you're already in heaven, then why is he asking for the dead in the grave to rise? That is because they're not in heaven. Jesus in John, which is interesting, he talks about the death of Lazarus. Did Lazarus is sleeping. He is sleeping in the grave until he heard the voice of God. And what's interesting about the resurrection of Lazarus is that if you think he was in heaven for four days, not a single thing is recorded in Scripture about it, and he doesn't say anything about it. If I was in heaven for four days, I'd be talking about it nonstop. I'd be writing books ad nauseum. But we see that Jesus correctly, and John, look it up, Jesus equates death with sleep. David is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. For David did not ascend into the heavens. That's Acts chapter 2, 29 and 34. And expound that, that for people who may miss it. Who was David? He's a man after God's own heart. He is well regarded. And yet, what did the scripture say? Where is David today? Dead and buried. And not only did the Bible say he's dead and buried, to did not, look, ascend. Did not ascend where? He did not ascend anywhere. He did not <laughs> ascend into the heavens. Exactly. He didn't ascend anywhere. But audience members, pay attention to that. Think about that. He's a forefather of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a descendant of David. Jesus is going to sit on the throne of David. And yet David, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us today for David himself did not ascend into the heavens. If David did not ascend to the heavens, what makes you think that when we die, we ascend to the heavens? What is the comfort that when we die, we're resting in the grave? I think there's a lot of comfort to it. Something that comes to my mind, in a lot of funerals, people will say, now, you know, they're in heaven, they're in heaven, my loved one's in heaven. But I think the people that come to my mind, about a year ago, my grandma died. But my grandpa died back in 2007, and he had been really sick. But when he died, my grandma was in relatively good health for her age. But over the course of time since then, she went through a lot of medical troubles and suffering. And I don't think, personally, the idea that my grandpa would have been happy with my grandma down here on earth suffering and him up there. But what the Bible teaches, that ultimately, my grandpa and my grandma, they're going to see Jesus at the same time. When Jesus comes and he resurrects us from the dead, those that have trusted in Jesus. And so I think, for me, that is actually a comforting thought, knowing that while this pain and sin is still going on, the saved don't have to sit there and wonder and worry about their loved ones because they're yeah. resting in Jesus. What's important about that is that it also prevents deception. Imagine if your grandmother showed up to you in your bedroom and you know she's been dead for a year. Knowing that the dead know nothing, and we'll get to a verse here, will allow you to know that that's not your grandmother, but Satan impersonating your grandmother to try to deceive you. Because look what Ecclesiastes 9, 5, 6, and 10 say. The living know that they will die. You and I know that if Christ doesn't come back while we are alive, that we're going to die. None of us has immortality. I'm going to read these verses without interruption. The living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. There is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And then if you combine that with Psalms 115, 17, it says the dead do not praise the Lord. If we go straight to heaven when we die, 
don't you think you'd be praising the Lord? Yeah, absolutely. That's what heaven's going to be all about. Heaven is a place where we're going to be worshiping and learning about the plan of salvation for all eternity. So this verse in Hebrews chapter 11, now chapter 11 is known as the hall of faith, where all these individuals died in their faith, knowing that they have hope in Christ. But if they would die and went straight to heaven, then the ending of Hebrews chapter 11 doesn't make any sense. And let me read it to you. I'll start in verse 35. It says, Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. Right? It's talking about that they may obtain a better resurrection. Now look at verse 39. Speaking of all the people who went before them in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, all these have obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. And what's the promise? Eternal life. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Why? Because the hope of the resurrection is that everybody who died in Christ is resting in the grave, and at the second coming, we all get to see heaven together for the first time. But right away, one of the objections I get is, yeah, but there are already people in heaven. But what do we know biblically from everybody who we know is in heaven, like Moses and Elijah? They bodily resurrected, with, with one exception, Enoch. He never died. Actually, Elijah never died either. The other people that are in heaven, they either never died and God translated them right away. And what's interesting about that, and maybe we can get into this more, go ahead, that go actually ahead. parallels to what is going to happen in when Jesus comes. Because when Jesus comes, there's going to be people who are living, who had not died yet, who are alive at the time of his coming. And those people are going to be translated. After the dead in Christ rise, they're going to go up in the air. And the Bible actually says, then the living will meet them in the air. So in other words, we're going to go together. But it's kind of like those two groups. So the people that we know are in heaven, like Moses, who died and was resurrected and then translated. Well, let me jump in here. For those who don't know, it talks about the resurrection of Moses in the book of Jude. Because you won't find the resurrection of Moses in the Old Testament, but it's in the book of Jude that it talks about it. And obviously, going along your lines, Moses and Elijah were at the transfiguration of Jesus, and that represents the two groups that you're talking about. Enoch and Elijah, they were translated without seeing death. That's going to be like those who are living when Christ comes and are translated, and Moses and what's so actually beautiful about this, I think, is that God didn't have to do this beforehand. In other words, the promise is for all the people is that at the end times, when that those that are dead will be resurrected then. But what God did is say, listen, I want to demonstrate that I have the power of the grave. In other words, he didn't have to do that. But in other words, so that we can have just one more reason to know that he is powerful enough to do what he said he will do. And then obviously the ultimate manifestation of that was the person who actually defeated the grave was Christ. And when he died, he defeated death and he took back that power. And so now we can fully have the confidence that what he said he will do, he is not only willing to do, but able to do. Amen, brother. Amen. And that's the hope that we have. And it's sad because many people are ripe for being deceived. And we see the importance of this because there's going to be deception in the end time. And we see that in the Old Testament story of the witch of Endor. E elaborate on that to the audience. What took place in the story of the witch of Endor? The mm. first king of Israel chosen by God was Saul. And he decided he started out good, right? He started out faithful and good, right? But between power and pride, right, he ended up straying from God. And towards the end of his life, sadly, his life ended not so great. But uh, he, because he had shunned, right, listening to God, 
he didn't feel comfortable talking to God. But the one guy that he had felt comfortable, who did have a relationship with God, was Saul, was uh, the one guy who he did feel comfortable talking to was Samuel, the prophet, who did have a connection with God. And but the problem for Saul was that Samuel had died, and Saul he had ordered when he was doing good things as king, he had ordered all of the mediums and witches and those that practice divination things, yeah. banished from the kingdom. But now that he's desperate, right, he doesn't feel like he has that connection with God because he has shunned God so often. He asks his associates, right, to find him a witch or a medium so that he can go and he can conjure up and talk with Sam and ask him for advice about battle and what the future is going to be for Israel and himself. And he does, he goes to this witch. So Saul disguised himself because if the witch knew it was Saul, she's going to be fearing for her own life. She's not going to, she's just going to think he's there to kill her or to have her banished or whatever. Um, so he disguises himself and he goes to her and he says, hey, bring up Samuel. for me. The thing about that is, is Saul actually sees Samuel or what looks like Samuel and sounds like Samuel and talks to Saul. And he tells him what's about to happen in this battle. And then the next thing that happens, Saul and his sons, they go into battle and they're all slain. And Saul ultimately takes his own life. And so we saw that was the tragic results of consorting with trying to talk to Samuel. And Geo, if you could expound on what actually that was. And that's what the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 16, verse 14 that it's the spirit of demons going out to deceive the world. And when you see an apparition of a loved one, when you see somebody, because we hear stories. For example, there's been a lot of movies. Oh, by the way, you had mentioned earlier, there's a lot of TV shows about spiritualism rising up. It started innocent with Bewitch and I Dream of Genie back in the 50s and 60s, but now you have more dark, sinister, even shows about Satan, and spiritualism is on the rise. And so the Witch of Endor shows us that when you're far gone from God, you're going to believe that the dead can talk to you. But Job 14, 12, and 21 tells us this, man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more they will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. And there is the Old Testament and the New Testament using the word sleep for death. His sons come to honor him, and he does not know it. They are brought low, and he does not perceive it. And Ecclesiastes 9.6 says, Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And why is that? Because the dead know nothing. And that's important. Because I don't want audience members to be deceived. And unfortunately, the majority of Christianity has this wrong. They believe this Greek dual philosophy that your soul and your body are separate. But your body is a soul. Your body and the Spirit of God form a living being or a living soul. And so that's important. And also Psalms 146.4 tells us, no that the dead cannot contact the living, nor do they know what the living are doing. They are dead and their thoughts have perished. If you're in heaven, you'd have thoughts. If you're in heaven, you'd be praising the Lord. And we've seen verses like this that show the dead do not praise the Lord. And as we mentioned earlier, those who we know are alive have been explain to us in Scripture that they've been either resurrected or translated. Remember the verse we read that David is both dead and buried and did not ascend to heaven, according to Acts. Yeah, that's a really good point. What I just wanted to comment based on what you said about the majority of the Christian world today, the thing I want to emphasize, too, is that what we're talking about is not like we can just make this, right? Obviously, we believe it comes from the Bible, mm -hmm. but there's actually been a strand of Christianity where there's been voices in Christianity that have taught this since the times of the apostles. This is going to sound like it's a roundabout point, but I think it, it's actually really important. So something that we've talked about in a previous episode is the importance of a separation of church and state, 
But what that means being that the state doesn't take authority over matters of worship. And why that's important for this issue is because, and I just looked up a couple of the names, um, Mm -hmm. for example, but in the first and second century after Christ, in the 100s and 200s AD, three prominent Christian writers, Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, and Irenaeus, who was a little bit later in the 200, around 202, they wrote about the, these things, about the doctrines of like conditional immortality, meaning you only get immortality as a free gift from God if you trust in him. And annihilation, which is the belief we're expressing that ultimately you don't have eternal life and there's going to be destruction for the wicked. And so this view of the state of the dead, right, was discussed. But what happened when Constantine decided to merge Christianity with governing power, then what the church decided it needed to do, the established church, was we really need to tamp down on these dissenting doctrines. In other words, we can't have this view and this view. Somebody needs to decide. And if you don't agree with it, you're going to get it on the sword for you, the Colosseum for you. And so that's when we started to see this false view elevated above the biblical view. But like I said, Christians have believed this from the beginning. There's so many more verses that we can talk about. 1 Corinthians 15, where it talks about the resurrection of the righteous and how we will put on immortality, because it's not inherent to us, and it will be changed in a twinkling of an eye. All that is based upon the resurrection. But there are some questions that people ask about this subject, and we want to tackle some of them. One of the questions that they say, but didn't the thief on the cross go to paradise when Christ said on the day that Christ told them he would? Explain to the people why they get that wrong and what exactly is happening there with the thief on the cross. So something that I think is really important we have to understand about the original language. In the original language, the original manuscripts, there is no punctuation in the original language. So that's something that the translators added. And I think it's interesting. If you say this is the same sentence that Christ said, but you emphasize different points, the sentence changes its meaning. So in other words, Christ said, I'm just going to say how many Christians believe it. I tell you today, you will be with me in heaven. Versus, I tell you today, you will be with me in heaven. So what's the difference between those two? One, it could be something like you're saying, like, listen, I'm telling you today, you will be with me in heaven. Or I'm telling you today, you will be with me in heaven. Again, because the punctuation's not there, I think what we have to look at is we have to look at all of Scripture and we have to see, so what is the most likely interpretation? And I believe, in line with what you and I have been talking about today, that really what Jesus was saying is, he's like, I'm giving you this guy who's been a sinner and a Amen. criminal your whole life. You're executed, and I'm giving you assurance today that you will be with me in heaven. All you've done, you've lived your whole life as a degenerate, and yet you've chosen to trust me and you believe it, and I'm giving you the assurance of salvation today. As you pointed out, we, even within the story, we see proof of where the punctuation should go. The comma should go after the word today rather than before it. And here's, we know why the comma should go after the word today. It's because of John 20, 17. Jesus himself did not ascend to heaven upon his death. It says, I have not yet ascended to my father in John 20, 17, because this is on Sunday. He was himself resting in the grave on Friday night and on the Sabbath, and then on Sunday, he had not yet ascended. So how could he be with the thief on the cross if Jesus himself did not ascend? It would make Jesus a liar, but he's not, because the comma goes after the word today. He says, I'm telling you today, you will be with me in heaven. When? When the dead in Christ are raised. That's important, and I like how you brought up that the original manuscripts do not have punctuation, but we can figure out the correct punctuation because of the fact that Christ himself was not in heaven 
on Friday. Here's another question. Doesn't the Bible speak about an undying immortal soul? How would you answer that? Well, ultimately, no. If immortality is something that God has. God alone has immortality, and he gives it to the saved as a reward for trusting in him. Yes, exactly. The reward of a faithful life, a reward of being saved by Christ, is being resurrected and given a glorified body. Now, there's a verse in John eleven twenty six that says, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Explain that to the people. How do you and I explain that? Ultimately, we know, just as a fact, that a lot of good people or people who believe in God or faithful Christians, that die. Ultimately, all of them do. So we know it can't be saying that directly. The Bible has a concept that there's two resurrections. There's a resurrection of life and there's a resurrection of death. The resurrection of life, when Jesus comes back at his second coming, those that have trusted in him that have died are going to raise. That's the resurrection of life. And they're going to raise to live forevermore. Maybe we'll get into this a little bit later, but after we, we go to heaven and as God then comes to establish a new earth and a new heaven, he's going to raise back up the wicked. And ultimately, the final judgment is going to happen where every knee acknowledges that God was just in what he did, who was saved and who was lost. It wasn't an arbitrary thing, but God was just. And when that happens, then there'll be the destruction of the wicked. And at that point, they will die. So when the Bible says, that he who believes in me shall never die, what he's talking about in the cosmic sense. In other words, that eternally you will live forever. Yes, and that's so important that you bring that out because when you look at the words of Jesus found in John chapter 11 about the death of Lazarus, he equates death to a sleep. So what he's talking about here is not the death that is equated with sleep because we all go through that. We all die. From Adam to us, if Christ doesn't come back in our lifetime, we're all going to sleep in Christ. But just like you sleep at night and wake up in the morning and time seems to go by fast, it's the same similar concept with those who are dead in Christ. They sleep in the grave until they hear his voice. For them, it's just going to be a blink of an eye. They will have not known or be cognizant of the passage of time. And when he calls them up, they'll be in their glorified body. A phrase I like to use when I do funerals is that they'll be resurrected with the vigor of eternal youth. I love that imagery because you're going to be in your best body. And I want to finish today's topic in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to read those verses and then we'll wrap up verses 13 and forward. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. And this is what Joey and I have been talking about, that death is equated as a sleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Here's the Bible emphasizing this sleep notion. He says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Elaborate on that. That emphasis on not preceding those who have already been asleep. What Paul is saying there is he's trying to head off the deception. In other mm -hmm. words, those of us that are alive, we're not going to precede those that are asleep. And those that are asleep, like, we're going to go there together, Amen. ultimately. And, and then, like I said, there's another and hold, passage. Hold on. And that's what we read in Hebrews chapter 11, the end, that the faithful who died did not receive the promise because God has something better for us, which we're all going to party together. Amen. Yeah, no, I agree. And this is like the other passage where it says that <laughs> the dead in Christ, we're going to be caught up to them. They're going to be raised. And we're going to be caught up to them. We're going to go together. And I think that there's something beautiful about that. And in other words, when God brings sin and death and pain to an end, 
ultimately, like, then we're all going to be, as believers throughout all time, we're going to have the greatest grand reunion of all time. And I love that because we're never going to be separated. Death will never separate us again. And I'm going to continue reading here, verses 16 through the end of the chapter. It says, for the Lord himself. Now listen to the imagery. Those of you who are finding this topic too hard to swallow, listen to the imagery. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So what's the imagery? The dead in Christ are in the grave. They are asleep. This passage used the word sleep several times. They are resurrected. We who are alive meet them, and together we rise to the Lord to be with him forevermore. And that is so beautiful because I'll get to see the newness of heaven with my father who died in Christ, with my grandmother who died in Christ, likewise your grandparents. And we all get to share that experience together, and that's the beauty of understanding what the Bible truly says about the state of the dead. Joey, give us your closing thoughts, and then I'll wrap us up. My favorite thing, what kept me in the church, right, was my belief that the character of God is good. And, like, that's the thing I want to drive home about here. In every doctrine, everything is centered around what is the one thing that God said definitively? God is love. He didn't say God Mm. is loving. He didn't say... God is displays of God is love at his being. And so I think in every doctrine, we have to examine it. A, obviously, what does the text say? What does the Bible say? But also, does our interpretation line up with who God is, right? In other words, and I think what we've been talking about today with the state of the dead and the immortality of the soul, I think it lines up. Because in other words, would a loving God, A, make people with immortality just to suffer for a finite amount of sins, suffer forever with immortality because it's part of who they are. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Would a loving God make, you know, people up in heaven, think of my grandpa, if he's up in heaven in 2007, he was old when he passed and for years go by and he knows, well, hey, his wife, she's got to be getting old, but she's not here. And then say, what, 20 years go by, 30 years go by, 40 years go by. Well, then he knows, well, she obviously died. You know what I mean? Mm And so it's like if people are up in heaven and not knowing for years where it is going to be. So I don't think that's loving of God. And so I think in everything, every doctrine, we should bring it back to what does this say about the character of God? Is this in line with who the Bible says God is? Amen. And it's true. God is love. And the Bible tells us that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. They will die. They will cease to live forever. They will be annihilated. But they're not going to suffer. My God is not a torturer. My God is a loving God. And this subject is so important because when you study the book of Revelation, there is going to be a battle about worship. There's going to be a battle about when to worship and who to worship. And there's going to be spiritualism is going to becloud the minds of people. And it's because they believe that spirits can contact people. Well, God says any spirit that tries to contact you is a demon. It's not your grandpa, it's not your grandmother or a loved one. And all these stories that we've seen of people saying they went to heaven and they saw God and they told them this and told them that, it's a lie. It's deception from the enemy. And we're going to do another topic on this because there are other objections about to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. That's the one I want to attack because that is so misinterpreted. Don't forget, and I'll conclude with this, that the Bible in Acts told us that David is both dead and buried, his tomb is with us, and he did not ascend to heaven. 
that's because David is waiting in the grave until he hears the voice of his master, Jesus Christ, saying, Arise and come home. Until next time, folks, stay in the word, and we'll expound on this again.